I'm Kathy Anderson. I am a member of the MVMA, obviously, and on the Animal Welfare Co uh, Committee. It is my pleasure to introduce the talks that we're going to hear this afternoon. The first one we're going to hear is going to be presented by Dr. Cami Haleski and, and Janice Sigford, and the title is, Who Has Better Welfare, the Barn Cat or the House Cat? Um, Cami Haleski is an instructor in the Animal Science Department at Michigan State University and coordinates the Agricultural Technology Horse Management Program. Her research interests are in the area of horse behavior, horse welfare, horse-human interactions, and working equids in developing parts of the world. She received her MS in Animal Science from Michigan State University in the area of horse nutrition and exercise physiology. In 2004, she completed her PhD in Animal Science in the area of animal behavior and welfare. Janice Sigford received a BS in science communication from Cornell University and then decided that she wanted to do her own science and not just write about the work others were doing. She received a master's degree from examining the impact of aging on the cognitive abilities of parakeets and a PhD in neuroscience from Washington State University in 2003, studying the ability of Mongolian gerbils to add new motor neurons to the spinal nucleus of the bulbal cavernosus, of the bulbal cavernosus after birth. While at WSU, she also worked on the CBM Companion Animal Behavior Science, resolving canine behavior problems. In 2003, she joined Michigan State University as a postdoctoral fellow studying in the behavior, welfare, and cognitive abilities of early weaned pigments. She is currently an assistant professor in the Animal Behavior and Welfare Group in the Department of Animal Science at MSU studying the behavior and welfare of animals, particularly laying hens and dairy cattle in response to different environments and management practices. Welcome to both of these fine women. Everybody, um, how many people is that on or not? Oh, I turned it on. judging competition over the weekend. Okay, I thought we had quite a few representatives. And how many of you here uh, sometime during college took part on a horse judging, livestock judging, dairy judging, or meat judging team? Okay, fair representative also. So back when I started my PhD, my major professor, Dr. Drago Zanella, and I would talk a lot about how could we excite more people about animal welfare. And he'd see these people wandering the hallways, practicing their reasons for horse judging or dairy judging or livestock judging. He said, somehow we need to get that same kind of energy applied to animal welfare science. Um, and so we did some brainstorming, and some of that brainstorming took place with some of the coaches of teams that are here in this room. And we decided we could probably come up with hypothetical scenarios comparing two farms, two facilities, two laboratories, et cetera, um, put that into a PowerPoint and ask people to integrate what they knew about animal welfare science with ethical assessment, come to a decision, and then present that to a panel of judges. So we've used that now for 11 contests, and it's been a, a really engaging way to get students very involved in critical thinking. And so um, when Lena was first talking, uh, Dr. Kaiser, when she was first talking about this conference and asked us what we maybe wanted to talk about, I thought, well, let's pick one of the scenarios that tends to make people think really, really hard. Um, and the one that we've found with some of our students that drives them just a little bit crazy is when we try to make them compare the welfare of a barn cat to a house cat. So we're going to work you through this. We're going to give some reasons that are fairly similar to what the students give during competition. We'll see what kind of conversation, questions, and discussion um, are brought about. If we end up with time, we're also going to go into a horse scenario as well. Um, but we're just going to see a little bit how long we um, end up spending on the cat scenario. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Janice. I'm going to try and attach a little 
calendar and see if it works. Okay, how's that sound? Is that good? Not working? I'll do something bad to it. I think so. Maybe it's upside down. <laughs> that might be critical. Oh. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just hold it. That seems to work better. Okay, so as Cami mentioned, we've done these scenarios um, for the welfare judging competition, and I also use them in my online animal welfare course because I can't take my online students out to the field or to the farm or to the, to the lab or the shelter to show them things. So I use these scenarios as teaching tools too to kind of give them an overall picture of the animal in its entire context and then ask them to make some kind of assessment. So we've used these in classes, we've used these um, for numerous seminars, we've used them for the judging competition. And as Cami said, the cat scenario is one that causes a lot of thought. I found that with my students, the closer they are to an animal, um, the harder time they have sometimes objectively assessing the welfare. So for me, I can get students to sit down, I can present them with information about tigers in a zoo, they can step back, look at the tiger literature, look at the tiger papers, think, okay, this tiger's better than this tiger, no problem. I stick a dog in front of them, crazy things start to happen. Horses, cats, same problem. So let's see what we can do with getting through this scenario. Well, unfortunately, I'm gonna need my hands free. So, move this. Let me see if, if I stick it here, does that still work? Okay, good. So I'm gonna definitely need to use my hands to advance the slides. Right, now. Usually I'm not too technologically challenged since I teach online, but apparently there are certain things that... Okay, I got one hand free, we can do that. All right, so what we typically do with the scenarios is we start off with a bit of background. So what's the cat's living situation like? Who does it live with? So in this case, we have two domestic um, uh, long-haired cats, same age, both females, so we've got kind of sort of equal starting populations of cats, um, but they've got different life histories. One was adopted from a shelter, uh, the barn cat was, along with a male litter mate. And then we have another cat that was purchased from a pet store. So there may have been some different background going on there. We have the house cat living with a single female. Um, she's at work 10 hours a day and she goes on camping trips on the weekend and leaves the cat with food and water. On the barn cat situation, we've got a cat that lives with a family. We've got a couple of younger girls and all of the family members are gone part of the day, um, but there's probably someone around more often. So those are the basic background overview slides. And here's a little bit about the environment, the physical environment in which they live. So our house cat lives in a, a townhouse in a northern borough of Seattle, so you can kind of think maybe an ooh-la-la -la kind of townhouse. Um, there's window seat perches, cat beds um, scattered throughout the house. There are some novel toys presented to the cat. Um, there's treats and catnip that's offered, at least on a weekly or semi-weekly regular basis. And this is an indoor-only animal, okay? So in contrast, the barn cat is on a 40-hectare farm. You'll notice we use metric a lot for our scenarios, scientific literature's metric, and we're an international competition. So we do usually put both units. Um, again, though, we're in northern, northwestern Washington here, so um, maybe a bit damp outside. Uh, the cat has access to blankets in the tack stalls and um, to the hay and straw in the lofter barn. Cat has the run of the farm during the day and is closed into the barn at night. And the cat has regular access to all kinds of things that are around the farm, like pieces of twine, feed bags, and small prey. And the, the cat, um, there, this cat in particular is, is fine, but there was another cat that suffered a road accident. There is a road that runs by, by the farm. So that's, that's kind of our, our basic background. And here's some pictures to illustrate. In the scenarios, we sometimes use video clips. We quite frequently try to supplement the text with a visual of exactly what is going on. So some of the things that we might expect you to take a look at here would be the cleanliness of the environment that we're presenting, the complexity. And you can also see the animals themselves, okay? So what kinds of conclusions would you be drawing from looking at these two different cats, okay? 
So the physical expressions of outcome measures in the animals themselves, not just the environment that they're looking at, they're living in. Okay, so in the scenarios, um, when I use these in class, I typically have points throughout the scenario where I ask the students to answer questions in a quiz about what they think about the welfare up to these points. In the contest, we just run the scenario straight through, and then the students present all of their reasons at once at the end. Uh, but sometimes for the purposes of class, it gives me multiple, multiple points to ask the students questions along the way. Okay, now let's get into the litter situation now. We'll talk about some of the specific management things that go on for the cats. For the townhouse, we've got one litter box for the cat. Litter is scooped every one to two days, and the box is fully cleaned every three to four weeks. And you can see a picture of the box at the bottom there um, that looks like there's something that needs to be scooped in the box. Um, the barn cat, the barn cat doesn't have a specific litter box, but there are um, horse stalls on the farm that have wood chip bedding in them. And frequently um, it's observed that there's piles of cat, cat poo as well as horse manure in the, in the stalls. And these stalls are cleaned each morning. So then you might ask a question at this point in the scenario as well regarding the litter. Um, you can see language here, so when I use this in class, it actually directs them to the quiz and says, please fill in the answers at this point. So then we can get into elements of nutrition. The house cat has dry cat food that's left out all the time for access. There's a water bowl there as well. Um, and then the cat also gets some wet food um, a couple of times a day. Uh, the barn cat, if there's a pan of dry food that's put out once daily, occasional scraps from the kitchen, and then occasionally the owners find evidence that the cats are actually hunting, so they'll find parts of dead mice or birds on the porch. Okay, so some, some supplemental feeding by the cats as well. Okay, now we can get into a little bit of the veterinary care and history. Uh, both of the cats are spayed. Um, the house cat was also declawed um, at, at the same time that it was spayed. It was, received some analgesic um, for pain management following the declaw. And this cat goes to the veterinarian yearly for a general checkup and dental exam and a cleaning if needed. Uh, the barn cat was spayed at the shelter prior to being adopted. And this cat goes to the veterinarian as needed for vaccinations. And here's a little bit more specifics on what they're being treated with or for when they're at the vet. So the house cat receives um, quite a range of vaccinations, including for FIV and FELV, rabies and RCPC and is regularly screened for things including heartworm and parasites. Um, and then this cat is also maintained on year-round heartworm and flea and tick preventatives. Uh, the barn cat does receive some vaccinations and is treated yearly for internal parasites and also does get some flea and tick preventative. Okay, so again, for the, the uh, class use of the scenario, we'd ask a question here about how they think things are stacking up. So we can look beyond now just the physical environment and beyond just kind of the management practices and see maybe what some of the social um, atmosphere of these animals is like. So the house cat is a solitary pet. There's no other animals in the townhouse. Uh, there's visual access to squirrels, passing cats, and birds that are outside. You can see the cat in a window perch there. Uh, the cat doesn't react too favorably when it does see other cats outside, just fairly strong hissing response, and then it chatters in response to seeing prey items outside. Uh, the barn cat, there's three other cats on the property. Uh, one is the brother litter mate that she was adopted with, and then there's another female and another male. There's also some dogs on the farm, one which occasionally chases the cat. Um, there's some horses, chickens, and cows, and there's a note that the cat often sleeps next to her brother. And there's a picture of one of the dogs with a cat there, and the cat um, should be able to get, guess from the posture there, is fairly relaxed about the dog being that close. <clears throat> okay, so for human-animal interactions, another piece of the social um, picture here, we've got the owner of the townhouse cat playing with the cat um, on a daily basis, about 10 to 15 minutes, and regularly brushing the cat and doing some checks to see that there's no fleas and the cat and the owner usually sleep together at night. For the barn cat, the girls um, at the house usually play with the cats after they get home from school. And whenever there's somebody out checking horses in the barn, they see the cat on about 95% of the visits out there. 
Uh, the cats are often involved in playing house with the girls. I'll leave that to you to decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and the mother occasionally grooms the cat and deals with any tangles that, that might occur in that long hair. So again, this could be another, another uh, area where we would stop and ask a question about how does this component look for the cats? Okay, so now how do the cats behave themselves? Well, one of the, the issues that the house cat has is that it does regularly inappropriately eliminate or mark. Um, there's some urine marking that's done under the windows and this typically occurs after the cat has seen other cats outside. And sometimes the cat inappropriately eliminates the owner's suitcase when the owner is getting ready to go somewhere. Um, the owner's response is to scold the cat and clean up the mess. The cat's response is to hiss at the owner when it gets scolded. Okay, so you should be thinking about things there. Um, the barn cats, we also have some urine marking that's going on there, but this is in a barn outside, so not sure who's doing it, and the owners aren't really too concerned. Um, we do have a little bit of aggression between cats that goes on at the farm between the two females, a couple of fights a month, and the cat in our scenario usually ends up being the one that runs away. Okay, so some things to think about there. And then we, one of the things we typically present is a time budget of what are the animals spending their days doing um, and how does that compare across the situations. So the top category here, sleeping and resting, is what both cats, is the single biggest chunk of thing um, both cats do, which based on cat biology is probably not a bad thing. Um, so we have a lot of sleeping and resting occurring, but more in the house cat. Um, we don't have any interaction with con specifics by the house cat, but 9% for the barn cat. Um, no interactions really with other species by the house cat, but a little bit with the, the barn cat, and that could be with the dogs. Um, human interaction is not too different between the two, with 6% for the barn cat, 4 for the house cat. Eating and drinking, 8% for the barn cat, 5 for the house cat. Solitary play with inanimate objects, 6% for the barn cat and 4 for the house cat. And then locomotion is a bit different with 13% for the barn cat and 6 for the house cat. And then time spent sitting and watching, the house cat has a larger percentage here with 18% versus 10. Okay, So there's some differences in the time budgets there that may give you some ideas about how the animals are responding to their environment. Okay, so that is the end of that scenario there. And so we usually end the scenario by asking them, okay, now you've seen all these different components, how do you rank this scenario? So as Cami mentioned, what she and I will do is each present you with a set of reasons um, for the welfare of these cats here. So while we're doing this, you guys can also think about how you would rank the welfare of these animals and what you find good or bad um, and what possible changes you might suggest to remedy some of the problems that you see. Okay? Okay. In this welfare scenario, I ask the judges panel here to consider his quality of life more important than perhaps longevity of life. Um, if we think in this term, I have chosen the welfare of the barn cat over the house cat. I view this partially in response to work by David Frazier talking about the naturalness, the opportunity for natural behaviors of an animal, um, and also work by Bernard Rollin that talks about the telos, or in this case, we'd be looking for the catness of the cat, if you will. Um, Certainly the barn cat has a much greater opportunity to uh, partake in natural behaviors. There's the opportunity for physical interaction with other familiar cats. The cat gets to have a wider variety of housing enrichment and also gets to engage in hunting behaviors, which is certainly a strongly motivated behavior for a cat. Um, one red flag from the house cat is the inappropriate elimination that happens, particularly uh, when the owner is leaving. Um, the, it's observed that this owner has a very close contact with this cat on a normal basis, and yet travels quite a bit, and the cat has obviously made the association 
between the suitcase and the leaving, and it would be strongly suggested that when the owner is gone, this is giving the cat reduced welfare during those time periods. Also, um, the post-punishment hissing of the cat would indicate that that is a negative human-animal interaction during that time period. Another advantage of the barn cat is that this cat was not declawed, and especially that those procedures did not have to happen at the same time. Even though through recent years declawing has become a somewhat more welfare-friendly practice than it once was, I still prefer in this case that the barn cat did not have to undergo declawing. We're not actually told what the body condition scores of these cats are, but based on the evidence we have of the ad limitum, dry feeding, the supplemental moist feeding, um, the picture making the cat look a bit plump that lives in the house, and definitely a significantly reduced amount of physical activity, it would be suspected that the house cat either is overweight or certainly would be at risk of becoming obese sometime in the future. I will definitely have to grant that the house cat has a reduced risk of fatality, especially in terms of being hit by a car. Um, this, the barn cat is kept in at night, which helps reduce some of the predator risk, but there still would be the chance of possible coyotes um, when the cat is out during the daytime. Uh, in addition, I would need to grant that the house cat has a more intensively managed health program. Overall, though, I can conclude mainly based on the opportunity to engage in natural behaviors that the barn cat has a higher standard of welfare than the house cat. Thank you. Okay. I would rank the house cat over the barn cat for better welfare, primarily for reasons of better health management, more appropriate nutrition, and a safe and comfortable environment. I would also consider that some of the problems that the house cat does face are more easily remedied than the problems faced by the barn cat. The house cat, by being kept indoors, is protected from possibility of death or injury via accident, predator, or aggressive encounters with other animals. Roch looks in a 2004 study found that road accidents were an important cause of poor welfare for cats as well as their owners. So this is a real concern for the barn cat, particularly as we have already seen one cat perish from a road accident on this farm. The house cat's environment, which includes novel toys, olfactory and visual enrichment, and owner interaction, is in, court, in accordance with many of the recommendations made by Rothschilds in 2005 regarding good environmental welfare for cats kept in indoor environments. Further, the house cat is fed cat food and so is receiving a balanced and nutritional diet that has been formulated specifically for the needs of cats. The bark cat's consumption of rodents likely exposes the cat to diseases and parasites which could have severe health consequences for this animal, particularly since the barn cat receives less veterinary care. The barn cat's not vaccinated for several highly infectious diseases that it could pick up easily from other cats in its environment or other cats moving through the territory, particularly FIV and FELV. Um, the barn cat's lack of heartworm preventative and testing is also particularly problematic since there are not really very good treatments for dealing with heartworm in cats. And even though the state of Washington may be considered to be lower risk than some other regions in the country, there is still a risk. Though the house cat is singly housed, the cat's reaction to other cats through the window suggests that this cat may actually not do well in a multi-cat household to begin with, and so single housing of this animal may be actually fairly appropriate. The cat, which is long-haired, does receive regular grooming, and there's no evidence of tangles or poor coat condition. However, the house cat owner should take several small steps to dramatically improve welfare. First, by limiting food intake, the cat's weight can be better managed to ensure that the cat is not obese and then thus likely not to suffer any long-term consequences associated with obesity, as per Alexander 2006. The owner should provide the cat with an additional litter box and clean this litter box much more regularly to reduce the inappropriate elimination behavior that occurs. The owner could also experiment with various types of litter, types of boxes, and cleaning schedules and locations in order to come up with what's optimal for the cat. 
The owner should also not scold the cat in response to inappropriate elimination as this is completely ineffective at changing the behavior pattern and is only furthering the negative interaction between the owner and the cat. The owner could try to mit mitigate some of the anxiety that the cat feels upon departure by either desensitizing the cat to departure or by getting a cat sitter to stay when the owner goes away on trips. Though the house cat has been declawed, a practice which can be associated with pain, pain was managed post-operatively, and there's likely to not be any destruction of furniture now in the owner's property, which could contribute negatively to the human-animal bond. So this cat is perhaps more likely to be retained in the household um, than a cat where there's furniture destruction, as problems of this nature can result in relinquishment of a cat. So, while I will grant that the barn cat does have many more opportunities for natural behavior, not all of those types of natural behavior are positive as we see with the aggressive encounters between the barn cats. Um, the house cat is a well-managed house cat, um, especially with, with the recommended changes that I've made, would have even better welfare. Thank you. One of the things that I think that this scenario points out is that each of us will have different things that are important for the welfare of animals. And so what we need to do as veterinarians and other people caring for animals is there has to be a balance. Uh, and I think that this points out that, that what is important to some of us is not necessarily important to others of us in terms of welfare of animals. Now there's certainly some things that are just plain as Temple says bad. And all of us can probably agree that they are all bad. But other things, it depends on what you grew up with, what your ethics are, what your view of society is, how you value things, what you think is important for these various cats. So. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I'm curious, now that you've had a chance to hear both of our sets of reasons. And, and we you did opposite sets on purpose. <laughs> and you had a chance to look through the scenario. Um, just going to do a simple poll here. How many people prefer the welfare of the house cat? Okay, interesting. How many people prefer the welfare of the barn cat? <laughs> I have to say, I, I thought it would be closer to a 50-50 split. I really, truly did. Um, so we'll engage in some questions and comment period, and then like I said, if time allows, we'll go on to our horse scenario, otherwise we'll just stick with the cats. Bonnie. We need to, to write better standards that reflect welfare, not just the philosophies of the people that are coming up with, this, with the standards, right? So that we need to actually be looking um, more clearly at what quality of life is, defining it carefully, so that it's not just something that can be interpreted differently by different philosophies. protected quality of life or a more natural quality of life. And so so actually, so I, I, had, I had to argue the house cat in this scenario. And, and for me, that's a, that was a tough one to do because, you know, to me, there are some, some problems there that even with the, the fixes I propose, there's still kind of a limitation to this cat. And there's some things that have happened maybe for this cat that, that shouldn't have, have happened. And one of the toughest things that we find with like the companion animal and horse scenarios is not just imposing what you want for your animal as an owner, 
but what really are the needs, the biologies that drive the animal. So for me as an owner, you know, I could sit there and make that case that, oh, I want to keep my cat safe and protected and, and in the house, and you know, that makes me happy as, a, as, a, as an owner, but right, where, where you have to actually, you know, to figure out biologically as much as you can what's in the best interest of the animal. Yeah. Often I think when, when an, people and animals are more intimately involved, it becomes a personal relationship. You've had some kind of a connection with an animal um, and that animal's personality that's impacted you positively or negatively. And a lot of times, especially when we've been in positions of ownership of companion animals or horses, where you have this daily very intimate bond and it's a dynamic reciprocal relationship, they become more than a, just a dog, just a cat, just a horse. And sometimes you lose sight of sometimes their specific species needs, I think, as a result. Maybe part of that is their own fault because they're so darn good at giving us what we want and in molding themselves to fit us. You know, I mean, we're not always great at understanding dog, horse, or cat communication signals. They're much better linguistic experts than we are. You know, they interpret the weirdest, strangest things that we tell them things that are completely species inappropriate, like patting dogs on top of a head is a sign of affection instead of aggression. And they're like, okay, it's just the human again, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> and, and so they're, they're so good at that that I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that they are different species, that there may be different biological drives going on there. Would you like to add anything else? I'm just gonna mention something. Um, my good friend Hillary Clayton, I see, is in the audience putting you on the spot for a second. Um, and she's come up with, uh, and I know other people have as well, but she allows her cats a lot of outdoor time, but has them trained to invisible fence so that she can keep them away from the road. Um, up until I heard that the first time, I didn't necessarily realize you could train a cat to invisible fence like you can a dog. So she's given me a, a whole new idea on ways you can give cats outdoor activity um, and dramatically reduce the risk. Um, okay, there's a hand up back there. So what, what impact does the cat have on the environment? Okay, so that's definitely a consideration, but that's not actually the cat's welfare, right? That's a bigger consideration. So for the cat just itself, if you look purely at the cat, oh, it should be able to kill all those endangered songbirds that it wants. No, but, but from the environmental perspective, right, there's a balance there, right? Do, do cats have a negative impact on the songbird population? And is that something you have to consider? I actually built a, a cat aviary, for lack of a better word, in my backyard where the cat was the bird inside and couldn't get out to the other critters. And they could access um, the aviary through, I had a, a cat door in the basement, they could climb up, get to the cat door, go outside through a little tunnel, and then spend time in their little outdoor enclosure. So that was kind of my solution to dealing with that conflict. But yeah, there, there can be problems. Do you know who was next, Kimmy? Okay. Can you speak up? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I think people think that cats need less care regularly than maybe a dog or a horse or something. And so people are kind of less aware and attentive to them after they've been through adventures or things like that with, with keeping track of them. Um, people take, tend to think of cats as lower maintenance and maybe that's not really actually true. So she was making the point that familiarity and comfort with your environment may actually make some surroundings better even if they're not ideal. So if we were to suddenly take that house cat and give him the barn cat's environment, 
that house cat may actually do pretty poorly because it would be so dramatically different for them that it might freak them out. I know some great examples of that actually from the zoo world where people have moved animals from kind of those old, nasty, small, impoverished enclosures to really big, enriched enclosures. And the animals basically just stereotype in a corner because they're just kind of freaking out and they don't know what to do with a new environment. So if you make changes that are dramatic like that, they should maybe be done very gradually, very slowly, giving animals a place of comfort to retreat to.